بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعض Concerning uh, this illustrious personality in uh, the history of Al-Islam like everything else concerning our da'wah we call people to take the middle path in all of your affairs take the middle path in the way you love take the middle path in the way you hate take the middle path in work take the middle path in resting talking don't be of the people who have ghulu who go to either extreme too far to the right too far to the left every day we make dua to allah azza wa jal as muslim surah al-fatiha to guide us to the sirat al-mustaqim some people they find it difficult to be balanced so Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala is an individual I don't know of any other personality who the people are as polarized as they are in this man past or present and what I mean what I mean by that is you find people they either love him or people they either they hate him those people who love him usually people of the sunnah alul hadith I wouldn't say Ahl Sunnah because people have hijacked that name and they don't represent Ahl Sunnah, Ahl Hadith. People who appreciate the Hadith and who appreciate pure Islam, they look at this individual and they appreciate what he gave to the world, what he gave to the Muslim community, spreading authentic knowledge, making jihad, fi sabilillah, all of the khayr that was inside of him, it was embodied with him as, in, as an individual and what he gave to the people as well. And those people who hate him usually are people of innovation, people who he opposed their way. He opposed the way that they thought and understood the religion of Al-Islam and aspects of the religion of Al-Islam. So in general, in general, as Muslims, the ulama, whether they're from your madhab or they're not from your madhab, they have a special place in Al-Islam. And as the great scholar mentioned, Al-Imam Ibn Damashq and other than him, talking bad about scholars, their blood, their, their, their meat, their flesh is poison. No one talks bad about the ulama except those people who are astray. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam informed this ummah the scholars, they are the inheritors of the Anbiya. So in talking about Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, in no shape, form, or fashion am I saying to anyone here, go overboard in your love for him. I'm not saying to you, he never made mistakes. I'm not saying to you, he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm not saying to you, he's greater than Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. Rahimullah Ta'ala. He's one of those scholars in the long line and long succession of ayat, mu'jizat, miracles that Allah Ta'ala sent men, real men from this ummah who showed us that he's an imam to be followed. Yuqtada bihi. But we don't follow him in everything. One of his greatest students, Al Imam Ibn Al Qayyim, Al Ibn Al Qayyim used to say, Shaykh al Islam is our Habib. We love him. He's our Habib. But the Haq is more loved, beloved to us and by us. He used to say that when he wanted to go against an opinion of Ibn Al Taymiyyah. Whenever his student wanted to go against the opinion of his Shaykh, he would talk, he would write, he would say, Shaykh al Islam, Ibn Al Taymiyyah is our Habib. But the haq is more beloved to us than him. And then he would tell his point of view about the issue, the mas'ala, that he disagreed with his teacher. So everyone is allowed to differ with Ibn Taymiyyah and other than Ibn Taymiyyah. So in this introduction, the first point that I want to draw your attention to, this talk is not to make you a person trying to get you to believe in, buy into. Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah is the greatest human being. He's bigger than the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's bigger than the companions. He's bigger than the four Imams of the Madahib. That's not what I'm saying here today. I'm saying develop and have an appreciation for the ulama of Al-Islam. And this one in particular, he's a tremendous scholar as you're going to see. Anyone who wants to read about a personality, this man, he broke the mold concerning those scholars who came later. His name is Ahmed. 
His kunya is Abu Al Abbas. Abu Al Abbas. It's worth noting Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah never got married to even have a child. So why did he take the name or the kunya Al Abbas, Abu Al Abbas? He followed the sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You, 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 even if you're not married, it is from the sunnah of the Nabi, an easy sunnah, easy, it doesn't cost you anything. It's like the beard, if you just leave it, you get rewarded for practicing this sunnah that's wajib. You don't have to do anything. If you cut it, you're making efforts to do sins. Just leaving it, you're going to get rewarded because that's what the Nabi did, that's what he ordered to do. Taking a, uh, the kunya, that's the sunnah, doesn't cost you anything. You're not even married. You say, if I get married, I'm going to call my son Abdullah, Ahmed, Bilal, Ukasha. If you do that, that's reward in that. Like our mother Aisha radiallahu anha. She never had any children, but her kunya was Um Abdullah. So Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, his kunya was Abu al-Abbas, and he never got married. He's from those scholars who didn't get married, not because he opposed getting married, not because he didn't have shahwa, not because he wanted to get away from that sunnah. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that he married women, and anyone who opposes a sunnah is not from him. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Mutaymiyyah, that wasn't his point. One of the main reasons he didn't get married, as you're going to see inshallah, the man was always in prison. His whole life was filled with one fitna after the next one, after the next one, after the next one, after the next one. Controversial. Fitting upon fitting. Another reason why he didn't get married, when he wasn't in prison, he was out making jihad. Fisa bilillah. He wasn't sitting in the masjid writing and teaching only. He used to go out and he used to fight people. Some of the ulama who didn't get married, great scholars in Al-Islam, Al-Imam al nawawi al nawawi who wrote the 40 hadith of al nawawi those hadith, that man never got married. And imam al-Suyuti never got married. Those ulama of al-hadith, of the sunnah, they didn't get married with the concept of the Sufis. I'm going to avoid women, I'm just going to pay attention to ibadah. That's not from the Nabi. The Nabi told those three men who came to his house, sallallahu alayhi wa and they vowed, I'm never going to get married and I'm going to pray all day, I'm going to fast all day. He said, I pray and I go to sleep. I fast and I eat and I get married as well. Anyone who avoids my sunnah, trying to get close to Allah by avoiding the dunya and the good things that Allah Ta'ala prepared in the dunya, he said, I'm not from that individual. The man was extremely busy. And let's just say for the sake of argument, for the sake of argument, for the sake of argument, Ibn Taymiyyah said, I'm not going to get married because women, they make you distracted from ibadah. Let's just say he said that. If he said that and he didn't, we don't follow him in that type of thing. The best thing for you is to get married, Abdullah. The Nabi, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that getting married, Man tazawwaja, Faqad akmara nisfa dinahu, Falyattaqillah fi shatr al-akhir. Anyone got married, he completed half of his religion. Let him fear Allah on the other half. If you're not married, you're not a complete human being. Allah created you and he created a woman to be with you. Now the issue is take your time in finding that woman. So he's Abu Abbas and he didn't have any children because he never got married. He didn't even have during that time what was prevalent. And what was prevalent during that time, even if you weren't married, you can go and you can buy a slave girl, a concubine. He didn't do that as well. With all of the jihad that he used to do, and the Muslims used to win those wars. They used to take those people and have captives. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah didn't pre preoccupy himself with that issue, and that was prevalent at that time. So he's Ahmed. His, son's, his father's name is Abdul Halim, and his grandfather's name is Abdul Salam. His nickname was Taqiyuddin. The scholars during that time, they used to give other scholars names like that. Taqiyuddin. And Imam al nawawi he said, anyone who calls me a nawawi Muhyiddin, he said, I won't free you in front of Allah. He said, when did Al-Islam ever die that it needed someone to give life to Al-Islam? He didn't like this type of nickname. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah's laqab was Taqiyuddin. He's known as Ibn Taymiyyah. People give different reasons why they call him Ibn Taymiyyah. 
one of the greatest, most famous reasons is because his great grandmother, her name was Tamia. So they attributed him to his grandmother. She was a lady who used to give dawah. She was a lady who used to give lessons. She was a lady who used to advise the people and Allah is a'la and a'lam. He's known as Shaykhul Islam. Some people who hate this Iman, this Imam and this man, some people who hate him, they said he doesn't deserve that name, Shaykhul Islam. They said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Shaykhul Islam. Rasulullah is Shaykhul Islam. He's the one who knows all about Islam. No one else should take that laqab. But in fact, that's not the case. That's not the case for many reasons. And that's the ghulu of the people who hated him. There was a scholar from India, Al-Hind. His name was Alauddin Al-Bukhari. He disagreed with some of the positions of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and he thought that they were weird because he went against what a lot of people were saying and he wasn't afraid to stand alone. When he gave opinions, he used to always have those delils for those opinions and scholars who took that position before him. He didn't care who liked the opinion. He wasn't into the business of trying to please people and appease people. He said it like it was and he let the chips fall where they may. This particular scholar from India, Alauddin al-Bukhari, ghafar Allahu lana wa lahu, he said, anyone who calls Ibn Taymiyyah Shaykh al-Islam, he's a kafir. Just like that. So if you ever called Ibn Taymiyyah Shaykh al-Islam, this man said that you were a kafir. And that's one of the problems of hosel takfir. So as a result of that, a great scholar came. His name is Ibn and Nasir al damishqi He wrote a book in which he just brought in it 80 scholars, 8-0 ulama from the Sunnah who called him Shaykh al-Islam. And he refuted that man. From them, obviously, is Al-Imam Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani called him Shaykh al-Islam. From them, obviously, is some of his students, Al-Dahabi, Al-Imam Ibn Kathir. From them, Al-Sakhawi, the great scholar of Al-Hadith. From them, Ibn al-Hadi. Many people called him Shaykh al-Islam. The other issue, Ikhwani, and this point, I'm just mentioning it to show you and to highlight how people have double standards and they go overboard. That man who said, if you call him Shaykh al-Islam, you're a kafir, he used to call Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, Al-Imam Al-A'zam, the greatest Iman. Al-Imam Al-A'zam, based on what he was saying, is the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you mean Al-Imam Abu Hanifa is Al-Imam Al-A'zam in that madhab, then that's true. If he meant that Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, Al-Imam Al-A'zam in Al-Kufa, that's true. If he meant Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, Al-Imam Al-A'zam in his opinion, from those who he saw, he knew, no problem. But technically, Rasulullah is Al-Imam Al-A'zam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in these issues, we shouldn't be fighting. There's no mashaha in the... Mustalahat. We shouldn't be fighting over these issues. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was the Amiru Mu'mineen. Amiru Mu'mineen. The real Amiru Mu'mineen is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the point is, Shaykh al-Islam, it used to mean in the Ottoman Empire that passed, the last Khilaf of the Muslims, it meant the Supreme Mufti. It was an official position. Shaykh al-Islam came way before that. Shaykh al-Islam during his time, it was the Imam who memorized the Qur'an, who understood the Qur'an, who knew the Sunnah very well, who spread the Sunnah, taught the Sunnah, and he practiced it within himself. They used to call those people Shuyukh al-Islam. And wallahi, he was Shaykh al-Islam. Not only that, but some of the scholars said he was a mujaddid, like the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ala ra'si kulli mi'ata sinna, yab'ath Allahu ta'ala rajulin, yujaddidu li hadhil umma amara deeniha. Every 100 years, Allah Azza wa Jal sends to this umma someone who's going to come and he's going to renew the religion. He's going to start calling the Muslims to those things that they got away from. He's from those people, insha'Allah ta'ala. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he was born in 661 and he died in 728. So he died when he was 68 years old, 67 years old. It is not possible to come in one hour and to talk about that long life of this individual. So we'll try to just deal with the most important aspects or the aspects that we think that you need to know. There's some beneficial points concerning his life. 
He was born in a place called Haran, which was between Al Iraq and Al Sham. It is right now in northeast Turkey, right now. It's still there and it's called Haran. <coughs> After reaching the age of five, his parents, his father, they made hijra with them because of the Tatars. The Tatars, they came on the Muslims and they decimated the Muslims and they began to destroy the Islamic empire and they came to a sham with Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and his family is what? Where they were and the father ran away trying to protect his religion and the religion of his family. So he took him to Syria, to a sham, to Damascus. His father, as I told you, Abdul Halim was a scholar of fiqh, a scholar of hadith. They used to call him Shihab al-Din. His grandfather was a big scholar in Al-Islam. Not a small scholar, a big scholar in Al-Islam. His name, as I mentioned to you already, was Abdul Salam. They used to call him Majduddin, Abu Barakat. For the students from amongst you, one of the best books in fiqh is far away from the madhab and being muta'asib. Like Fiqh Sunnah, that book Fiqh Sunnah is a book that tells you what to do and how to do it without forcing you to be on any madhab. Just what the Quran says, what the Hadith says, and you follow that. His grandfather, Abu Barakat, he wrote a book called Muntaka Al Akhbar. Al Imam Al Shokani came. Hamid ibn Ali Al Shokani. He came and he explained the book of the grandfather of Ibn Taymiyyah and he called it Nadal Altar, one of the best books of fiqh in the dunya. In all of the dunya, Nadal Altar. What's that book, Nadal Altar? As Shokani came, he took the book of the grandfather of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Muntaka al-Akhbar, and he explained those hadith. He explained those hadith. And that Nadal Altar is a dilil that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah came from a family of knowledge. He had a number of brothers. One brother was Abdul Rahman, a scholar. Another brother, Abdullah, a scholar. Abdullah told the people a lot about Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, his brother. One of the things he said about him, he had the ability to write in one day between Dhuhr and Asr, what a normal man would write in a week or in a month. He said that he used to write so fast that when he would return to his, what he wrote, he didn't have the ability to, understood, to understand what he, write, what he wrote because his writing was bad. Now pay attention to this. I know a family, one of the subjects that we take in school and we continue to take in school our children is how to write, penmanship. They said that Ibn Taymiyyah wrote so bad, his writing was so atrocious that even he couldn't understand what he wrote. Was an indication if your child doesn't write very well, it doesn't mean he's stupid. Doesn't mean that he's dumb. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah was Abkari. Abkari. He was one of those people who was a genius and he was barely able to write his own handwriting. Now, of course, doesn't mean that your child shouldn't be taught how to read and write and he shouldn't, pressure shouldn't be put on him. It just goes to show. We have to put in context what people can do and what people can do. He had a number of other relatives, all ulama. And the point that I'm mentioning that to you for is, those of you who are trying to be students of knowledge, I want to be a student of knowledge. It is hypocrisy. For me, Abu Usama, to be paying attention to reading the Quran and the Sunnah and giving the khutbah and giving dawah, and I leave my children crazy. I leave my wife crazy. She's into Bollywood and other than that. I want to be a student, but I leave my children and my family and they don't know anything. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, one of the factors that helped to develop, in, in, help develop him into being a scholar, he was in an environment of knowledge, in an environment where the father and the brother and the uncles and the people around him were nurturing him on that issue. So this is something that we have to struggle and strive to implement. Marry that girl, that lady who appreciates a discussion about the deen. Don't marry that girl who she doesn't want to hear anything about the religion. She just wants to know how much the latest shoes cost and things like that. Don't marry that individual. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala in a young age, he memorized the Quran at the age of seven. I'm not here to talk about everything that happened when he was a young man, but it is worthy 
of our attention that two things come out about his personality when he was young. Number one, he had an impeccable ability to memorize. He can memorize anything and everything he put his mind and his effort to. Allah blessed him like that. And number two, at a young age, he knew the value of time. At a young age, many men don't know the value of time. At a young age, he was preoccupied with memorizing and learning when he was just a young lad. The other people from his contemporaries were busy playing around, goofing off, doing different things. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah was an individual who was paying attention to developing himself and learning. So as a result of that, he became a teacher at the age of 19. In Darul Hadith, he became a mufti at the age of 22. And when I say mufti, I'm not talking about what happened today. I get a call from one of our community members. He's in Mecca. He wants to know from me, can he do multiple umrahs from Mecca? Can he go to the Tan'im and come back? So I tell him, don't do that because the Prophet wasallam never did that. None of his companions ever did that. That's not a fatwa, I'm not a mufti. I just give him the opinion of what I know. Ibn Taymiyyah was a mufti at the age of 22, an official position where he sat and the people brought their issues to him from the community. At the age of 22, during that time when they had ulama, it gives you an indication and an idea of the weight of this man in the scales. He was not a joke and he wasn't a lightweight. Rahimahullahu tabaraka wa ta'ala. Concerning Ibn Taymiyyah, some of the scholars of Al-Islam of the past, they praised him. And there are many statements, like Al-Imam Al-Dhahabi, he said, if someone were to ask me to swear at the Maqam of Ibrahim and to swear at the Yemeni corner, that I've never seen anyone similar to Ibn Taymiyyah, nor did he see anyone similar to him, he said, I will swear without any hesitation. And then Imam Al-Dhahabi is from those historians in Al-Islam, unparalleled. Al Imam Ibn Daqiq al-Eid, great scholar of Al-Islam. He said similar things like that. Between that man, between his two eyes, was the knowledge of Al-Islam and the dunya. He took from whatever he wanted to take and he left from whatever he wanted to leave. Scholars from other madahib, Badruddin al-Aini was Hanafi. He said, Ibn Taymiyyah, this particular man, he knew the knowledge of the other madahib more than the people of those madahib. He was a marja, a point of reference for the Muslims. And many people said other things. And why is that important? What the scholars say about someone is more important than what the Ammatana say. I have an agenda, so I say that this individual, he is this and he's that and he's this it. But who am I? That's my opinion. As it relates to me, it's important. But as it relates to the reality of the situation, it's not really that important. Shaykh al-Islam was praised left, right, and center by the ulama during his time and the ulama after him. So don't listen to the people who he doesn't know his elbow from his ankle bone in al-Islam. And he comes with his opinion. Shaykh al-Islam is a kafir. Concerning Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he had a status and a distinction that Allah ta'ala blessed him with, but he blessed him with this status, status and distinction for many reasons. Just want to name a few. Why did he surpass Al-Imam Al-Dhahibi, Al-Imam Ibn Kathir? Why did he surpass all of those people during his time? Why is he the one? If I were to ask the people here, Al-Imam Al-Sakhawi, who was he? Many people never heard of him. Why do we know Ibn Taymiyyah and we don't know Al-Sakhawi? Why? There are many factors and many reasons that set him apart from the people. At the top of the list, the knowledge of the man. If Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah gave a fatwa, if he wrote a book, if he gave a class, if he gave a khutbah, the people who listened to the knowledge that emanated from him and that came from him, irregardless of their madhat, they said, this man right here, he knows what he's talking about. If the scholar sat in his class or attended a session in which he started talking, that scholar was said, this man knows what he's talking about. 
Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah's knowledge, the man wrote over 900 books. Nine, zero, zero. I don't know anyone in the dunya that has done that today. 900 books, many of which we were able to get and many of them are lost. And the books that he wrote, some of them were written in prison when he didn't have his other references. He was in the prison, especially in the beginning. He would write books in the prison in which he would mention the ayat of the Quran, obviously, memorize them. The ahadith and what book the hadith was in. He would write the athar, what the companions said and what they did. And he would write the names of the books and what the scholars who wrote that book said about this issue and that issue from his memory. The man was an ayat, an encyclopedia. What happened to all of those books? What happened to him? Many of them disappear for multiple reasons. One reason is because people used to come to Sheikh al-Islam from different places like Al-Iraq. Three people would come to visit him. He would ask three questions. He would ask four questions. He would ask six questions. Ibn Taymiyyah would answer and they would write the thing down. Those three people would take what he wrote and they went back to Iraq. The book is gone. And that happened a lot. When the student realized that this was happening, they said, hey, Imam, let us start writing these things down. And he said, okay. But many of his books, they left in that way. Another reason, the Tatars, the Tatars, they were criminals, they were monsters. When they started to attack the Muslims and the Muslim empire, they destroyed many of the books, not only of Ibn Taymiyyah, but many ulama of that time and before that time. In Al-Baghdad, the Tatars, they took so many books of the Muslims, threw them in the Euphrates rivers, in the Euphrates river, and the ink from the river became, made the water become blue. They did the same thing throughout the Muslim empire. They wanted to erase and eradicate all of the knowledge of Al-Islam. Wahayhat, hayhat. The Imam read the ayah today, Yuriduna and Yutfi Unur Allahi bi afwahim. They want to extinguish the light of Allah by blowing it out, by making these kinds of efforts. But Allah Ta'ala is going to complete his light. He completes his light how? By giving the Ummah people like Ibn Taymi and other than that. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Ironically, another reason why his books used to they were lost, some of his enemies. Some of his enemies would go to people who had his books and purchase from him the book. This is how much people hated this man. The hatred that is not natural, it's not healthy. To hate an individual to the degree where you lose your ability and your sense to be fair and just. That's how they were. They would purchase the book and they would destroy the book. Trying to do away with the knowledge of the man. As a result of his knowledge, his pristine knowledge, his sharp mind. Allah Azawajal caused him to rise above his contemporaries. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Another reason why the Imam has distinction is his ibadah, ikhwani. Right now, in this class, right now. This class that I'm giving right now for me, and this class that you're listening to right now, is better than making jihad in the month of Ramadan. I want to repeat that. It's better than making jihad in the month of Ramadan. It's better than reading the taraweeh in the month of Ramadan. It's better than sitting down memorizing the Quran in the month of Ramadan. The Nabi, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mamin Ayamin, Al Amulu Salihu fi Hinna Ahabul Allahi min Hadi Al Ayat. Kila Ya Rasulullah, when Al Jihadu fi Sibili Lahi. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa lal jihadu fi sabili lahi illa rajulun kharaja bi malihi wa nafsi thumma lam yarja bi dhalik bi shay He said there are no days in which the good deeds are done in those days that are better and more beloved to Allah than these 10 days that we are in right now the hijjah The companions say Ya Rasulullah what about making jihad in another month in Ramadan, what about if a person made jihad in Ramadan and the person here today, he makes the dhikr after the salat. Which one is better? The Nabi said doing the good deeds in these days is better than jihad in any other month. Unless the person in another month went out to make jihad and he was killed. He got an istishhad. Now that person is better. So the point here, the point here is 
These are the 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. The question is, who fasted these days from amongst us? The question is, after the Salat, who is the person from amongst us who can say, I pray Sunnah prayer before and after each and every prayer where there's a Sunnah prayer? Who from amongst us can say, in these days after the Salat, I made the dhikr for every Salat or most of the Salat? Who can say, since these 10 days, Maghrib, since these days began, I didn't miss a single prayer in the masjid? All of these things that I'm asking you right now, they were adi to Ibn Taymiyyah. They were just natural. It was a part of who he was. He was a person of ibadah. The great scholar from his students, Al Imam Ibn Al Qayyim, he said, Ibn Taymiyyah told him when he asked him, why do you make the dhikr so much? We see you and you make dhikr in a way we don't see it with anyone else. And he used to try to hide to make the dhikr. But there are just some things you can't hide. Like being in the masjid making dhikr. It's the sunnah. Stay there and make the dhikr. You can't help it. Why do you make dhikr so much? He said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said to me the dhikr is like the water is to the fish. If you take the fish out of the water, what's going to happen to the fish? He said the fish is going to perish. Ibn al-Qayyim said, I pray Fajr one day in his masjid because Ibn al-Qayyim was the Imam who used to pray in another masjid. He had a beautiful recitation. They said, Ibn al-Qayyim, if you came into his dars, just hang your heart up at the door because he was going to take your heart and captivate you. He said to a sheikh, I pray with him one day. He prayed Fajr and he sat there and made dhikr until midday. He said after he was about to get up, he said to Ibn al-Qayyim, this dhikr that I make from Fajr time to midday, it is my morning meal. If I didn't do it, I find that my body becomes weak. Who from amongst us? This is our way of ibadah. You find Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah being a man who made isti'ana billah. He only sought help from Allah. All of those problems that he had, the people would be nervous from his students. Oh, we're all going to jail. We're all going to prison. They used to come to Ibn Taymiyyah and they said when we came to him, he would calm us down as if he had no worry in the world. He used to make it istighatha billah, asking Allah to give him the ghoth, give him the help and so forth and so on. If an issue came to him about a mas'ala, he couldn't figure it out. It was difficult. He said, I will make istighfar up to a thousand times. After the istighfar, Allah will open to me the mas'ala. The point, ikhwani, is the man was a sahib of ibadah. In as salafiya alul hadith, those scholars, and Ibn Taymiyyah was from them, they were people who, they had kalam. But they weren't people who were just about kalam. They weren't just about kalam. The kalam is important. The man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, tell me something that I can only ask of you. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Qul, Amantu Billahi Thumma Staqim. Say, say, I believe in Allah and then be upright. So, Kalam is important. It's important. Al Iman is what you say. Al Iman is in your heart. Al Iman, it comes out on your limbs. As a result of that level of ibadah, Ibn Taymiyyah, he rose above the rest. He was distinct as a result of that. And a lot could be said about his ibadah, but there are a lot of things we want to share with you. Another issue, Ikhwani, that set Ibn Taymiyyah above the rest, and this is important. Ibn Taymiyyah was an individual who was fair and just, and he had a lot of rahmat for the people. He was fair and he was just, and he had a lot of rahmat for the people. He used to say, and I want you guys to remember this. He used to say about Ahl Sunnah. Ahl Sunnah, A'lamu nas bil khaliq wa arhamu nas bil khalq. Remember that statement. He wrote it in many of his books over and over and over and over again. This man has a madrasa calling to a salafiyyah, defending a salafiyyah. And this fitna that salafis are dealing with right now between ourselves, fighting each other. Ibn Taymiyyah gave the people a tariq to follow. It's not permissible for anyone to cause everybody to follow one man. It's not permissible for anyone to come and test the people based upon a man or a slogan. You bring those statements and you say, this imam, he's a madrasa in our dawah. But look what he said. Ahl sunnah 
They are the most knowledgeable of the people concerning Allah. They know about the Tawheed of Allah, his names, his attributes, where he is, where he isn't, what he said about himself, how to understand those names and attributes. Allah comes down, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is shy, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has two hands. Both of those hands are right hands, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Sunnah, they know how to understand that. They know about Allah more than the other people. And he said, and they're the most merciful of the people towards the creation. And that's because that's how the Nabi was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was merciful towards the jahil, the one who didn't know. He was merciful towards the youngster. He was merciful towards the lady. He was merciful towards the young girl. And he didn't force her to get married. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was merciful towards his enemies. Those who were against him, the Nabi was merciful. Instead of making dua against them, he made dua for them most of the time. Ibn Utaymiyyah was like that, fair and just. One of the judges during his time, is, he was a Qadi, he was a judge, Maliki, Ibn Makhlouf, when he was in Egypt, they went to the Sultan and they lied on Ibn Utaymiyyah. They told the judge that Ibn Utaymiyyah said this and he said that. Many of these people lie on the man, even till today. Attribute to him what he didn't say. They told the Sultan he did this, he did that. The Sultan put him in jail. When they looked into the issue and they investigated, they found he didn't say that. The Sultan took him out of the jail and he said, now, now, get retribution, get revenge. And he was trying to encourage him to give him the word to kill them. <laughs> Ibn Taymiyyah told the Sultan, those are from the ulama. If you kill them, it's going to be fitna. If you kill them, you're not going to find other people from the community who's going to take their place. Ibn Makhlouf, this man who was part of the problem, he said, Ma ra'aytu ansafa min Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah. I never saw anyone more fair and just than him. We tried to kill him. When he got power over us, he pardoned us and he let us go. That's how he was. Sufis, Sufis. Sufis were present there during his time. They asked him, What's your position about the Sufis? And in Syria, they have the whirling dervishes during that time as well. What they do and what they believe, crazy things. Shabbarat, Mawlid and Nabi, all of that stuff. It was present during his time. They said that the Nabi had ilm al ghaib sallallahu alayhi wasallam. What's your position concerning the Sufi, Shaykh al-Islam? Look at the justice. He said, the Muslim community, many of the Muslims look at some of the Sufis as the Sufis, they see them as being the best in the creation. He said, and that's wrong. He said, there are other Muslims who see the Sufis as being people outside of Al-Islam for what they're doing. He said, and that's wrong. And he read the ayat in Surat Fatir. For min hum zalimun li nafsihi wa min hum muqtasad wa min hum sabiqun bil khayrati bi idnillah. From them are those people who oppress themselves. From them are those people good and bad, they mix it up. And from them are the people who are doing a lot. The people who have zuhd. The people who are doing really good. So he was fair and just. He didn't say all oh, Sufis are no good. Sufis take this kalima today. They take that kalima of his today. And they say, you see, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah is big enough people of tasawwuf. And that's not true. What he was doing was just being honest. It is a fact. From the Sufis are those people who have good akhlaq. They're trustworthy. They memorize the Quran. They're not fooled by the dunya and other than that. And from them are those people who introduce in Islam what's not from Islam. Some of them even fall into shirk and kufr. Some of them even put themselves down, lower than the dogs. Like those who ate the defecation of their sheikh. The sheikh has so much barakah. If he were to defecate, use the toilet, akramakum Allah, they would pick it up and eat it and put it on their faces and say this is from the barakah of the sheikh. No, that's out of the religion. So the point, Ikhwani, is the man, he passed everybody in terms of his rahmah for the people and his justice. But there's a point I want to make and I want to make it clear. Although Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah had rahmah on the people, his student, Al-Imam Al-Dhahabi, he said Ibn Taymiyyah was tough. He was a tough personality. He was a tough personality. Especially when he debated with people. 
الذهبي said لا لاطف ما خصومه لاجتمعت كلمته بين الناس only if الذهبي his student said this only if he was more gentle with his opponent if he dealt with his opponent when he debated if he was just a little bit more gentler with them then the people would have accepted what he said but he would pull out the sword when it was time to debate and there have been said about his personality he used to get angry quickly and he had some toughness in his personality he said but but he used to yusabbir nafsuhu. He used to make himself become sabir. Some of us, some of us, we get really upset with our wives. Really, really upset. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm at the top of the list. Really upset. It's natural with some people. Some people naturally not like that. Some people, they take the sword out and they say and they react to that anger. Ibn Taymiyyah al dhahabi said was an individual who would get upset. But when he got upset, he didn't execute that anger. He would force himself to be gentle. Now I don't mention that to put him down and I don't mention that to talk bad about him and I don't mention that to show how great I am that I can take this out. I mention that in the same vein and the same light that we mentioned about an Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullahu ta'ala the scholars who said that he fell into some issues shows that he's a human being rahimahullahu ta'ala and Ibn Taymiyyah is a human being as well so he used to tell his students when I get upset with the opponent I get upset because of my ghira, my jealousy for the sunnah but don't take that from my personality he used to tell them don't take that for my personality. Rahimahullahu ta'ala. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him, had a number of issues with people who were close to him. One of the great scholars of that time, his kumi was Abu Hayyan al-Andalusi. He was like the Sibawai of that time. He loved ibn Taymiyyah. He praised ibn Taymiyyah, Abu Hayyan from Spain. He was a companion to Ibn Taymiyyah. He said, I never met the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah. And he said that after they fell out and they became enemies. Why did Abu Hayyan say that? He said that because Abu Hayyan, as I mentioned, he knew the language better than Ibn Taymiyyah. He was like Sibawai, Farazdiq. He was one of those men who knew in Nahu. Ibn Taymiyyah said to this man who loved Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah was a sheikh. He said to this man in a tough way, the man was praising Sibawai. He said, Sibawai has over 100 mistakes that are proven that they're mistakes through the Quran. He didn't understand them. He said they were lies. Ibn, uh, Ibn Sibawai, he lied over 100 times, proven by the Quran. He said, Sibawai doesn't know that he did it, and you don't know that he did it. The man took it personally. Because that lisan of Ibn Taymiyyah, it hit him like a sword and he broke off from him. So he lost some friends along the way. Again, why am I mentioning that, Ikhwani? I'm mentioning that to show the point. No human being deserves to be followed unconditionally except one human being. Only one, only one. Now I'm going to ask you the name of that human being. And I just want everybody to tell me what's the name of that human being or who he is. And if anybody, if anybody doesn't say it, I'm going to deal with you. <laughs> the one human being who we follow unconditionally. Who is he? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu ala rasul aim. He's from the awliya of Allah. Umar Uthman Ali. Then Jannah, Ara Rasul Ain, all of them from the awliya of Allah. May Allah put us with them Yomul Qiyamah. Wallahi, they're in the Jannah, Jannah al Firdos, Wa Rabb al Kaaba. But we don't follow them indiscriminately. A Shaykh ibn Baz, a Shaykh al Albani, a Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen, we don't follow them indiscriminately. A Shaykh Rabi, we don't follow him indiscriminately. Don't blindly follow anybody. And don't be one of those people who says, I'm with the Imam. Wherever he goes, I go. He going to the hell, I go to the hell. <laughs> Blind following is another issue. It's another issue 
but it's not from the way of Ahl al-Sunnah, it's not from the way of Ahl al-Hadith, it's from the way of the Yahud and the Nasar and the Mushrikeen. وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَذِيمٌ يَتَوَارَى مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ أَمْ يَمْسُكُهُ عَلَى هُنِنْ أَمْ يَدُّسُهُ فِي التُّرَابِ أَلَا سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ During that time, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, his wife carried the baby nine months. They had the baby, a baby girl. The people come and say, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, your wife had a baby girl. When they hear it, their face become black. Out of, out of being embarrassed. And he starts to hide from the people in the street. He doesn't want his friend and his uncle and his relatives to see him because he had a baby girl. And then he starts to think to himself, should I take this baby and should I bury it alive or should I keep it and be low in the dirt? And then Allah said, what an evil decision they made. What would they decide to do? They would dig a hole and throw the girl in the hole and put the dirt on the hole. That's a taqlid. Mushrikun. You ask Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, why did you bury your daughter in the dirt? He'll say, that's what my mother and my father did. Why do you say Hazar Nazim? That's what my mother and my father did. Why you don't do Raf Ali Adain? That's what my mother and my father did. Don't be of the people of a taqlid. Sheikh so and so. Al Albani said it. Al Albani is not a Dalil. Sheikh Rabbi is not a Dalil Al Al Hadith. The Dalil is the Quran and the Sunnah. And we say that, let the chips fall where they wait. Don't be of the people who blindly follow. The blind follower, he blindly follows in an issue that he doesn't have the ability to understand. In Mirpur, in Mirpur, in Mirpur. Our Mirpur, our Mirpur. There's a farmer walking behind the oxen. He's walking behind the cow, plowing the land. That individual, he doesn't know what he's doing. So he has to ask the scholar. He asks the scholar and he blindly follows. Because he doesn't know. Can't read, can't write, he doesn't know. It's okay for him to blindly follow, but he shouldn't talk. He sees another brother and he blindly follows and he doesn't do Raf'u al-Yadain. That one does Raf'u al-Yadain. The farmer starts saying, no, you must do it. No, you must. Yeah, just be quiet. Blind follower, just be quiet. So Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala is like everybody else. He makes it correct and he makes it incorrect. But the majority of what he did and said was correct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah ikhwani, very important. He learned logic, al-mantaq. During his time, the knowledge of people who were looking and reading into what Socrates said. They were looking into what Aristotle said. They started to take that and try to implement that knowledge in al-Islam. In Ibn Taymiyyah, he learned logic. He learned it. And from the sunnah is not to learn about al-kalam. Not to learn about this thing. All of those books that the ulama of the Salaf wrote, Al Barbahari, Al Imam Ahmed, and Asur al Sunnah, all of them, Al Alakai, all of them, Ibn Abi Asim, all of them, from the Asul of a Salafiyya, not to be of Ahl al Kalam, not to read it, not to learn it, not to debate with it. Ibn Utaymiyyah, he learned it, which goes to show. Ikhwani, we can't take the statements and the actions of the Salaf out of context. The Salaf never sat with innovators no matter what. So I can't sit with my family? No, don't use that as an example. They were tough in sitting with the innovators and sometimes they sat with the innovators. It depends on what's going on. So why did Al-Imam, Shaykh Al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah learn mantiq? He learned it in order to refute those people. He has a book called Rad Aramantiqiyin, the refutation on those people. And the way he used to refute them is he used to refute them using their logic. He used to refute them using their language. Listen to me. I do not advise that you read those types of books. I do not advise that you read some of the books that Ibn Taymiyyah wrote because he didn't read them for the Amma, he didn't write them for the Amma Tanas. The language is complex. Many people who accuse him of this and that, they read his statements, and yes, sometimes he did say that. 
but he's speaking and repeating what they said. He's writing and he's speaking and he's thinking on the lines of what they said and what they thought. So for you to come and say, he believed this, he said that, yes, he said it, but he wasn't saying that, believing in it. It's complex, so don't read it. At Tadmuriya, we want to learn Aqidah in this place. He wrote a book of Aqidah called Al Hamawiya, another one, Al Wasatiya. Those are not the books of Aqidah that you start off with right away. Ibn Taymiyyah was on another level. He wrote books for the regular people. He wrote books for Kufar, and he wrote books for the people who were logical thinkers, the people of Kalam. And the general rule is, the knowledge of Kalam is haram and we shouldn't do it. It's like the Dajjal. When the Dajjal comes, if you're here, don't go to him trying to be inquisitive to find out. Just go the other way. Run away from Al Kalam and the people of Kalam the same way you would run away from a hungry lion if he were to enter into this room. So Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he wasn't from the people of Kalam, he was Salafi in his madrasa was Salafiya, but he did learn Kalam and he did it in order to refute those people. Now we come to the issue of the Jihad and the efforts of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah has a book called Al-Hisba. Al-Hisba is talking about the responsibility that you have in the community to correct things. Anything that goes on in this masjid that's wrong, there's a repugnant smell. For an example, the masjid is not clean. Someone left the windows open. Anything, there's no access for the one who's handicapped. Al-Hisba is the responsibility that everyone has, the Imam has, the administration has, to make the society as perfect as possible. He wrote a book about that. He wrote a book called Al-Amr bin Maruf wa Nahi an al-Munkar. This was what he was about. He sat in the masjid, he gave lessons, he wrote books, he gave fatwas, but Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he used to get busy. What did he do? In that area, there were a lot of mausoleums that were built, a lot of shrines that were built. Ibn Taymiyyah physically used to go and he used to break those things down. But he wouldn't just go and break it and cause fitna. He would break it, and in the meantime, while breaking it, he would do two things. He would explain to the people why the shrines were not halal, and he would explain and expose the reality that people who you're saying in these graves are not even in these graves. Historically, he showed them that the companions who they were worshiping were not even in those graves. And number two, he would explain to them through intellectual arguments, the regular people, how doing this is not permissible. So he used to eradicate it. And that was the sunnah of the Nabi. Ali radiallahu anhu. He said to one of the people during his time, Allah abathuka adama kana nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yubithani. I want to sing you into the land to do something that the Nabi used to tell me to do. He said, yeah, yeah, send me. Allah ajid qabran mushrifa illa sawaytahu. Ya Ali, the Nabi said, Go through the land and travel. Go to Yemen. From Medina to Yemen. And as you travel, any grave, any grave that you see built above the ground, make it equal to the ground. That's the sunnah. And also, Adi, any picture that you see, then deface it. Statue, pictures, break the arm, break the head, cover it over. Adi, when he traveled, that's what he did. It's the sunnah. But when Ibn Taymiyyah did this, Amr bin Maruf, Nayan al Munkar, he didn't do it in a way that caused fitna. Another thing, Ibn Taymiyyah used to get with his students and other than them, because there were Ahl al Kitab in the area, there was a lot of khamr going on, and the Muslims were drinking and getting high. Ibn Taymiyyah used to go to those taverns and he used to break up the wine glasses and he used to order the people not to do that. And the people were happy as a result of that. The man was always busy with Al-Amr bin Maruf and al nahi al Munkar. In our masjid, people of the Sunnah, in this masjid, we come to the masjid and we find that the Saf, the Saf in front of us, it's not connected. There's space. 
We're not taking care of, we're not feet to feet. It's a small issue. And the person of the Sunnah doesn't say anything. He doesn't have to give the khutbah. He doesn't have to give the lesson. But he should have some love for the ghira. This is a masjid of Ahlul Hadith. And the meaning of Ahlul Hadith, the people love the Hadith. Not a masjid, wear this and they're brilliant. Wear this, they're the Ubandis. Not, not that. Ahlul Hadith meaning, in this place, if someone came from China and he was on the Sunnah, when he came into this masjid, he smelt the aroma of the Sunnah. He saw the way the Imam read, the way the people were. This is the masjid of Alul Hadith, and nobody had to tell him that. Just by what he saw in the masjid. Al Hisba and Al Amr bin Maruf and Al Nahi and Al Munkar. Another issue is Ibn Taymiyyah used to give dawah to those Christians and those Jews in that area. That's a special area for all of the three groups of human beings, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. It's the area where many prophets and Anbiya and Rasul were, Salawatullahi wa salamu He wrote a book called Al-Jawab al-Sahih, Liman Baddala Deen al-Masih. The true word and the true answer to those and for those who changed the word of Isa ibn Maryam. He wrote to the king of Cyprus, showing him how Christianity wasn't real. He used to write to the Jews and the monks and the priests, encouraging them to come to Islam, exposing their falsehood that they put in the Torah and the Injil and what they believed in. The man was busy. That's why he didn't get married. As for the jihad of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah Khwani used to speak against the rulers. He used to speak out against the rulers, but he didn't do it in public. People who like the takfiri way, people who make takfir, they like to take Ibn Taymiyyah's statements and actions, and they use them out of context to make khuruj and to make takfir of people. Ibn Taymiyyah wasn't a mukaffir. He said things to the rulers, but he didn't say it in public. He didn't say it in the khutbah. He did what the Nabi said, the sunnah. Men arada an yansaha, dal sultan, fal yakhudu biyadi, wal yakhlu bihi, fin kabila minu fabihi wa ni'ma, wa in nam yakbal, fakad eddema kana alihi. Anyone who wants to advise the one in position of leadership, let him take him by the hand and let him seclude himself with that individual and then let him advise him. If he takes it, you did what's on you. If he rejects it, then it's not your problem. My wife, your wife, she better not come in front of my friends while we're eating and she comes inside or behind the door and she says, Hey brothers, Abu Sam is the leader and the imam in this house. He did this and he did that and he did that. You people do good. If she did that, it's going to be a problem. Because I'm the imam and you're the imam and you're not going to accept that from her because it's wrong. You're sitting at the table. You're sitting right here. Your wife is there, three kids there, three kids there, and the wife starts to say to you, hey, you did this and you did that in front of the kid. You're gonna say, hey, 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 what are you doing? She has to talk to you and her alone. The imam, the administration in this masjid, you don't get up in front of the people and you talk like that. That's the sunnah. Like it who like it, hate it who hate it. That's what the Nabi said. Ibn Taymiyyah used to do that. Also, he waged war. He fought against the Tatars. And he fought many times against them. And he used to explain to the Muslim rulers why it was wajib to fight against them. And he spent a lot of time fighting against them. And he was an example when it came to fighting. Ibn Taymiyyah fought against the Christians who were in Sham. They expelled the Christians during his time. He was there fighting that jihad. Ibn Taymiyyah fought against the Rafida. You know the Rafida of Syria right now. Hassan Nasrullah from Hezbollah. Lahu min Allahi ma yastahiq. Don't get twisted and fooled by the Miraj in Iran or other than Iran. Those people have never helped Islam and they will never help Islam. How in the world can a Muslim think that a person who curses Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu are trying to help Al Islam? How is that? Hassan Nasrullah from Hezbollah, when he talks, just say, Kadhab, because he's lying. 
Ibn Taymiyyah fought against his group, the Alawiyin and the Nusayriyin. They believe that Ali is Allah reincarnated. He fought against them with the Muslims and drove them up into the mountains. So he was a mujahid fi sabilillah. And one of the jihads that he had to deal with, Ikhwani, was the jihads that came as a result of the books that he wrote and the positions that he said. And we almost finished here, although we still have quite a bit to go. Ibn Taymiyyah, look at the fitna, Ikhwani, look at the fitna. Look at the fitna. And this is just a few of the things. Look at the fitna. Inshallah, after we finish this talk, every time I come to Huddersfield, the brothers always feed me from this restaurant. They make this chicken with some aluminum foil around it and it has some chicken stuff, some rice stuffed in it. You guys know what I'm talking about? Some place you have the chicken and aluminum foil and rice is inside of it. I love it. You just got to get all of the aluminum foil off of the skin because if it get in your tooth, it's a problem. Ibn Utaymiyyah didn't have those luxuries. Look at this. Fitting of Ibn Utaymiyyah. In the year 698, he was 37 years old. He wrote a book, Al Hamawiya, about the Aqid of Ahl Sunnah. Big fitna, they wanted to kill him as a result of a book that he wrote. Hey, don't kill me. Let's just come to the marketplace of open ideas and have a discussion. Why do you want to kill me? But that's how much people hate you when you don't see it their way. I don't see that man as being an innovator. You understand? I don't see that particular group as being innovators. I don't see it. As a result of that, I'm a Catholic. As a result of that, I'm a Muqtadi. Yeah, what's wrong with you? What are you talking about? Because I don't agree with you, you don't agree with me, we don't speak anymore. So when he wrote that book, al Hamawiya, there was an explosion. After that, in the year 705, he wrote the book, al Wasatiya, the book again for some people from a place called Wasat. He wrote for them the Aqid of Ahl Sunnah. When that information spread, they wanted to kill him for writing the book. He could have remembered al Hamawiya and remained silent, but the people came to him and asked him a question. He wrote a book for him. Here's the book, Aqid of the Ahl Sunnah, Ahl al Hadith. Take the book. They wanted to kill him. At this time, his name started to spread as being a person who was an enemy of Khurafat and Shirk and Bid'ah. So the people said, We have to do something to this man, something with this man. So they called him to Egypt. From Asham, he went to Egypt. In the year 705, after writing Al Wasatiyah, they put Sheikh Al Islam ibn Utaymiyyah in prison for eight years. Months just because he wrote a book, Kala Allah, Kala Rasulullah, 18 months. He left his country. The Sultan said, Come. He went to Egypt. When he arrived in Egypt, they put him in prison for almost two years just for writing a book about the Aqidah of Al Islam. He got out of prison after being in the prison for 18 months. When he got out of the prison, they said, you have to go. You can't live here in Cairo. You have to go and live in Alexandria. When he went in Alexandria in the, in the year 709, they imprisoned him there again for eight months. Why? Why? Because of the same book. They said, you weren't in prison long enough. Now that you're here, we're going to put you back in prison for eight more months, making it more than two years. And he had already did his time. He was in a prison. After that, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Utaymiyyah came out. They put him in prison again in the year 720. He was 59 years old. They put him in prison just because of some verdicts that he gave. Fatwas. Where the Dalil was with him. Pay attention to this because this is a recurring issue. A man says to his wife, the way people think you divorce the lady is to say, you're divorced, you're divorced, you're divorced. We think that's the right way of getting divorced. That's the wrong way of divorce. If the man wants to divorce his lady, just say, you're divorced at the right time and that's it. Now this is not a class about divorce, but the four medhabs. Ibn Utaymiyyah was Hanbali, and he was a mujtahid in that medhab. So for the one who comes and says, it's a bid'ah to have a medhab, that's a problem. Many scholars before us, they had medhabs. If there was a Hanafi scholar in Huddersfield, he knew what he was doing. 
and he was on the Sunnah. And when the Quran and the Sunnah came and the Madhab went against it, he pushed it on the side, like Abu Jafar al Tahawi used to do, like Ali al Qari used to do, and they were Hanafi. If he was like that, I would say, go and learn from that man. It's just a systematic way of learning your religion, that's all. In those four Madhabs, Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, all four of them say, if you divorce your wife, your divorce, your divorce, your divorce, they said it's irrevocable. That's in every madhab. Ibn Taymiyyah said, no, I don't agree with that. He said, during the time of the Prophet, if someone did this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet counted it as one. During the time of Abu Bakr, it's Khilafah. If someone did that, he counted it as one. In the beginning of the Khilaf of Umar in the first two years, if a person did that, he counted it as one. But during the time of Umar, when the people started doing it a lot, Umar said, anyone who does this three times, I'm going to make it count. And he explained to the people, it's not my position. The people of the Madahib got upset with him. The Hanbalis had Rahmah, but even from them, people were jealous. They got upset with him. They put him in prison just because of verdicts like that where he showed how all of the madhabs can be wrong in an issue. All of them can be wrong in the issue. So the delil is not what the imam said, is not what the madhab said. The delil is what Allah said and what his prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But we use the statements of the imams as light. Pay attention, ikhwani. The Quran is here for an example and it's with me. This book of benefit is here with me. The Quran is with me right here. You turn this light off, you come into this room, you close the door, you don't know where this book is. You can't find it in the dark. You can't. You're going to be stuck at the door because you're in pitch black darkness. When we flip the switch for the light, the light comes on and it helps you to find the book. The scholars are like the lights. When the light comes on, the scholar helps you to go to find the book. And they explain what the book said. But that light is more powerful than that light. That light can go out at any time. That light has a faulty fuse in it. The light is not the Dalil. The light, the light is a medium by which it helps you to see the real light. That's not the goal, that's not the objective. This is the goal and this is the objective. So Ibn Taymiyyah was trying to teach the people that point and he used to get in trouble as a result of it. Rahimahullahu ta'ala. Lastly, he went to prison because he banned the people from traveling to al Medina with the niya of going to see the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He banned the people from traveling throughout the world with the niya of going to a grave or a shrine. He said this is not permissible, even for the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because of the hadith that's authentic. No one should make an effort to go and travel to see these things, these massages, these places, except three masjids. So he explained why he took that position. The people said he doesn't love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We heard that kalam before. Because he said that, they put him in prison. And that was in 726. He stayed in prison for two years, 728 he died. And look at the time that he died. He died in the inn when they took his pen from him. Prior to this, they used to let him write. But during this time, they took his pen from him and he died in the prison. Died in the prison. When he was in the prison, and I'm finished with this, when he was in the prison, Rahimullah, he turned that negative into a positive. And that's what life is all about. What Allah Ta'ala decreed on you that you perceive as being a negative, you have to somehow, some way, find a way of translating it into positive energy. When he was in prison, the prison became a madrasa where he taught the prisoners and he cultivated the prisoners. Some people used to commit petty crimes to go to the prison to learn inside of the prison with Ibn Taymiyyah because his madras in the prison was better than what was out there in the free place. And people were giving up their freedom to learn from the man in the prison. Ibn Taymiyyah inside of that prison, it gave him an opportunity to start dealing with 
and confronting the deviant ideas that were prevalent in the city, in Egypt, in Asham. The people of innovation, he dealt with them, he wrote against them, he preached against them, and he caused the light of the Sunnah to spread. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he came out of the prison once and he wrote to his mother, he said, I'm going to stay in Egypt and I'm not coming back to Sham because my presence here in Egypt with what's going on is more benefit than going back to that area. So the point is, Asa an yuhibbu shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum. It may be that you like something, it's bad for you. It may be that you hate something, it's good for you. He used to take all of those issues and he made it an example for us to follow and to learn from. As I told you in the beginning, Shaykh al-Islam during his time, the one who knows the Quran, he knows the Sunnah, he calls to it, he defends it, he spreads it, he teaches it, and he's an Imam to be followed. He was an Imam to be followed in these types of issues. Don't give up hope. The Sunnah is going to spread, but it needs people who have the commitment to try to make it spread. Don't be afraid of the people. From the students of Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, and if we just mention one student, his students by themselves is enough to show the goodness of Ibn Taymiyyah, just a student, like Ibn Qayyim, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Daqiq al-Eid, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. These men, they were mountains of knowledge. Al-Imam al-Mizzi, he was Amir al-Mu'mineen in Hadith. Ibn Taymiyyah was a sheikh, but he was stronger than Ibn Taymiyyah in Hadith. He was Amir al-Mu'mineen in Hadith during that time. Ibn Abdul Hadi, Ibn Muflih, all of these people and other than them were students that this man helped to develop. And as I said, he was a madrasa. Just like Al-Imam Ahmed is a madrasa. After him, Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah came, a madrasa of Salafiyya. After Ibn Taymiyyah came, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab Ikhwani, is nowhere near Ibn Taymiyyah in knowledge. And Ibn Taymiyyah is nowhere near Al Imam Ahmed in knowledge because the time difference between them and the way life was and the way scholastic aptitude was at that time. But nonetheless, they are Imams of our Dawah who we should come to know about, we should learn about. And I don't know any days better than these days to make that presentation. So we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to cause Al Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, inshallah ta'ala, to be in his grave with Noor and Rahmah, and that Allah Azza wa Jal help us to be of those people who carry that legacy that he and those other ulama of Ahl al Hadith were upon in terms of defending and spreading and supporting the Sunnah in a balanced way, a Salafi in a balanced way. Not the people are too rough and too tough. And not the people who apologetic and acquiesce. And for those of you who don't know, a salafiyah is just understanding the Quran and the Sunnah and taking it and embracing it the way those companions understood it. How they understood the Quran, how they understood the hadith, how they worshiped Allah, what they did and what they didn't. That's a salafiyah. You don't have to come to this masjid ever in your life to be salafi and to be on the correct way. You don't ever have to come to a particular masjid. It's not a group. No man is over us. It's just taking Al-Islam and Musaffa, pure Islam, clean Islam. Something that we want these young brothers to be upon in a way that is pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's our responsibility, the elders from amongst their fathers, uncles, brothers in this masjid, to make this masjid and other than this masjid to become a beacon of light that helps to develop that. Again, in the middle, not too far over there, not too far over there. And Allah is A'la and A'lam. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah's family, they were humble. Razi Muqallad, Argar Muqallad. She asked the question <coughs> that the family of Imam Ahmed were following the humbly matter. Was Ibn Taymiyyah a Muqallad or was he a Ghair Muqallad? Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala was a Mujtahid in the Hanbali Madhab, a Mujtahid. And it's not permissible for the Mujtahid to make Taqlid. A Taqlid is taking someone's opinion and you don't know where he got his delil from. You just blindly follow him. He says halal, you say halal. Haram, you say haram. And you don't know. So you're making a Taqlid. 
Ibn Taymiyyah and his family, they were not like that. And they were the ones who those Imams meant. Khwani, pay attention. When Al Imam Ahmed said, La tuqalli duni, don't blindly follow me, and don't blindly follow Malik, and don't blindly follow Al Ozai, and don't blindly follow Sufyan al Thawri, who was he talking to? He was talking to Ibn Taymiyyah. He was talking to people who had the ability to understand the proofs. He wasn't talking to Ahmad Bakr Z from the people, that man in Mirpur behind the oxen. He wasn't saying to that man, don't blindly follow me. That man has to blindly follow the Imam. He was talking to you and me in issues that are bigger than us. But if it's in an issue that you have the ability to understand, Raf Uli Adain. Someone can easily come and bring you the delil why you should do Raf Uli Adain and you're smart enough to understand it. In that issue, don't blindly follow what goes against that. But other issues that are big, and Imam Abu, Abu Hanifa, he said to Abu Yusuf, Way Hakya Yaqub. You write down everything I write? I'm a human being. I say something today, I say something tomorrow. He was talking about, he was talking to Abu Yusuf. Was he talking to you and me? He was talking to you and me in issues that we have the ability to know Abu Hanifa was wrong in that. The girl has to have a wali. For an example, you can't drink a nabiv. Issues like that. We have the ability to know that. But issues that are too big for you, you have to, I have to, blindly follow when we don't know because the issue is too big it's too big for you this house i want to get in our mortgage can i do it can i not do it i'm in this situation can i do it can i not do it the issue is too big for most of us you go to the sheikh the sheikh explains to you the delil you don't know what he's talking about and some of you have the ability to know what he's talking about so al imam ibn taymiyyah was a mujtahid and he did not blindly follow anyone and that's why he went against the four imams and he used to go against his own madhab many times, many times and look at this ikhwani he had around him people who were on different madhabs like Ibn Kathir was Shafi'i and he used to love Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Taymiyyah loved him and the fact that they had different madhabs didn't sour or destroy the relationship so his family were not muqallidin but some of us we have to be muqallid because we don't know and when you make taqlid you do it and be quiet don't argue about the point because you're ignorant you don't know you just blindly follow and you you follow someone who you trust so you have to go to the imam of the sunnah don't blindly follow the one of bid'ah and shirk and khurafat don't do that make sure he's a person of the sunnah and then you blindly follow him in that particular issue that's too big for you uh, take a written question inshallah then another question from the floor the question here says that who were the Mujassima and was Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah one of them? The Mujassima ikhwani, comes from the word Jassim, which means the body, the body, the body. They have some big word in English, I can never pronounce it. How do you pronounce that word? Anthropophosimism? How do you pronounce it? Yeah, this thing. It's, it's from what the Jahmiya said and the people of innovation. Allah Azawajal, He described Himself as having certain characteristics. He said to Iblis, Ma mana'aka an tasjuda lima khalaqtu bi yadayya. What prevented you, Iblis, from bowing down to the one that I created with my two hands? Allah Ta'ala has two hands, and both of those hands are right hands. The Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hearts of the sons of Adam are between the two fingers of Ar-Rahman. He changes it the way he wants to. <coughs> Allah Ta'ala described himself as having certain characteristics. Yawm al-Qiyamah, he will say to the Jahannam, Halim Talat, are you filled up? The Jahannam will say, Is there anyone, does any man anymore to come? Because Allah promised He's going to fill up the Jahannam with people. So He said, Are you filled? They say, Any more to come? And then it will be no more. 
The Jahannam will say, cut, cut, that's it. And then Allah will put his foot over the hellfire. Sahih al-Bukhari. Ahl sunnah Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the Imams of Ahl sunnah Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, Al-Imam Malik, Al-Imam Ahmed, Al-Imam Shafi, our ulama, forget the other people, our ulama are of the opinion that these attributes, when they come to us, we believe in them. We don't ask how, we don't ask why, we say the reality of it is with Allah. He knows, we don't know. We believe in it, but we don't ask how and why. No forward. We say Allah knows how and all of that, but we believe in it and that's it. So he wasn't from those people. Allah Ta'ala speaks. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا Verily Allah spoke to Musa with speech. A person comes, the logical people, the mantiqiyin that Ibn Taymiyyah refuted. They come and they say, well, every person who I know, if he speaks, he must have a tongue, he has to have teeth, he has to have a voice box, he has to have a larynx, and on and on. The companions didn't say that. That's said it here. The Lord of the said, Stop where the companions stop. They didn't ask the Prophet when he read the ayat. Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa. Allah is over his throne. He went over his throne in a way that fit his... None of them said how, why, when, how, what day, what... They didn't say that. Bani Israel, they're the ones who say that. What color is the cow? What day should we sold the cow? Why in this white? Muslims, the, the companions didn't do that. So he was the furthest person away from that. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ سَمِيلُ الْبَصِيرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ هَلْ تَعْلَمْ لَهُ سَمِيَةٍ None is like unto Allah. None. Nobody. Do you know that he has someone similar to him? So we establish these things and we leave it just like that. Like it who likes it, hate it who hate it. Like it who like it, hate it who hate it. And don't waste your time debating with these people. And Imam Malik, when the people used to come to him, the man would say, hey, I want to debate you about one of these issues. And Imam Malik would do multiple things. Sometimes he would put his finger in his ears and he would say, as for me, I know my religion. Go look for someone who's in doubt like you and debate him. Some people he would say, hey, 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 how Allah went over the throne, that's what you want to talk about? He said, going over the throne, al-istiwa, we know what that means in the Arabic language. It means to go, to rise up. That's what it means. Nazul means to come down. A hand, this is a hand in the Arabic language. Speech, we know what that means in the language. How it is, how he went up, how he came down, how it, we don't know. To believe in it is wajib. You got to believe in it. And to ask about it is an innovation. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. And it will kick him out of his lesson. So don't be of the people who are faint hearted about that. We believe in that and that's it. In English, Akhi Karim, I don't know much, but I'm pretty sure if you go back to the Google, you Google it. You young brothers, mashallah, you got baraka. Got that Google. We didn't have Google in 1986 when I became Muslim. We didn't even have cell phones like this. We had those big cell phones, you put them up, and they were real big. You go to Google. But his students and people who came after him, they wrote about him extensively. So people translated that stuff and they put it on the Google. Like the book by his uh, student, Muhammad ibn Umar, ibn Abdul Hadi. He wrote a book called Al Qurud al Durriya fi Manaqib Shaykh al Islam, Ahmed ibn Taymiyyah. The illuminated pearls concerning the virtuous aspects of Ahmed ibn Taymiyyah, in which he wrote about what the man did. And Imam al Dhahabi wrote about him extensively, his students, in Arabic. So I don't know anything in English, but I'm pretty sure there must be. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw a book in English. There are a number of books about Al Imam al Bukhari, Abu Hatim al Zur'a, uh, Abu Hatim al Razi. Uh, Al Imam Muslim, Al Imam Malik, Abu Hanif, and Ibn Taymiyyah. It looks like this. Yeah, I did see that. I never read it. But I know the one who wrote the book is a person who's trying to spread the Sunnah, and the people are printed. Also, people are trying to spread the Sunnah. So 
I don't remember much about that book, but go to the Google. Jazakallah Khair Sheikh, could you please mention some details and information regarding the funeral of Ibn Taymiyyah? Ikhwani, one of the things that we can mention about Ibn Taymiyyah is Ibn Taymiyyah was a man who had mu'jizat. We consider him to be from the awliya of Allah, insha'Allah. Is Ibn Taymiyyah in Jannah? No, from our aqidahs, we don't say anybody is in Jannah unless we have dalil. We don't say anyone is no matter how much we love him. We don't know where he is. He's not a companion. And also the companions, the one who urinated in the masjid, the lady who committed zina and was stoned to death. The companions are better than Ibn Taymiyyah. The least of the companions, better than Ibn Taymiyyah. Anyway, concerning his life, he used to tell the people things were going to happen, and he would tell Al Imam Ibn Kathir, Al Imam Al Dhahabi, he would tell them things about their personal life that they knew that they didn't tell anybody else. And he used to say, How did you know that? He would tell them, Don't ask me how I know. He would tell the army what was going to happen tomorrow. Do we say he had ilmul ghayb? Don't say he had ilmul ghayb. Maybe Allah showed them those things in his dream. Maybe they were inspiration. Allahu alam. Concerning his death, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, when he finally died in the prison, it was an awesome occasion for the people. He was one of those imams who his janazah was similar to the janazah of al-imam Ahmed. Everybody came out in the community with the exception of three people. Three people were really against him and made a lot of trouble. They didn't come out not because they hated him. They didn't come out out of fear. If they came out, they knew the people may kill them. So there were tens of thousands of people. His janazah was prayed over by his brother Abdullah. His janazah was, his body was watched by the great scholar of Hadith and Mizzi, his student. And those who were close to him from his students and his relatives and the people of virtues, they were the ones who were allowed to come into the prison and take his body, wash the body. And the streets of the area were filled with people out of love, honor, respect, and reverence of Ibn Taymiyyah. So the people of, of, of the Sunnah, they say, they continue to say, the distinction between us and them is during the time of the janazah of people of the sunnah just look how many people come out and they participate in the janazah of al-imam al-albani as sheikh ibn baz as sheikh ibn uthaymeen just look it shows those who love them and those who were not on the same page as them they have respect for these individuals so his Janazah, it was a sign that the man was loved. And one time there was a janazah that was passed by. It passed by the Nabi when he was sitting in his companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, Wajibat. And then another janazah came by and he said, Wajibat. It's wajib. The companion said, why did you say that two times, Ya Rasulullah? He said, the first people who came by, the first janazah, you people spoke well about that individual. So it's wajib that he goes to Jannah. Antum shuhada'ullah fil ard. You people are the witnesses of Allah on the earth. And the second man that came by, you speak, people spoke bad. What a bad guy he is. He owed us money. He's smoking crack. He's doing that. He's doing that. You say he's a bad guy. He says he's wajib. He's going to go to the hellfire because you people are the witnesses of Allah and the earth. So when all of those people came out to witness his janazah, it's a bushra. It's one of the signs of a good khatima. A person who dies and he has sweat on his forehead, it's a sign of a good khatima. A person who dies right after doing a good deed, it's a sign. He died in Ramadan, he died in Hajj, he died after Hajj. A person who died from a stomach ailment, he drowned, a wall fell on him, he burned, she died in childbirth, it's a good sign. The person died on Friday, it's a good sign. One of the signs of a good khatima is that the people spoke well. The Nabi told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if 40 people of Tawheed pray on your janazah, they're going to make intercession. Another hadith said 100. He has 70,000 people. From them, ulama, tulab, students of Hadith and ilm and fiqh and tawheed. And I still can't see and say, Wallahi, he's in Jannah. I don't know if he's in Jannah. When I can narju, we hope that he is in Jannah. Question from the floor, you spoke. What was 
Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah position with regards to the Mawlid because those who celebrate it say that he said that if one does it with love and good intention it wouldn't be considered a bidah. Brother asked the question that what was the position of Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah regarding the Mawlid because the claimants of the Mawlid they say that Ibn Taymiyyah said if a person does it with good intention he will be rewarded. Allahu A'lam Akhi, I can't say for sure I feel that this is something that I read somewhere. I feel that this is some truthfulness to it. But I can't speak with knowledge, with clarity. But even if he said it, the Dalil is not Ibn Taymiyyah said. Ibn Taymiyyah has a book, Ikhwani, is called Iqtida Sarat al Mustaqeem fi Mukharifati Ashab al Jaheem. Being different from the Kuffar. The book is just about the importance of Muslims being different from non-Muslims. He talks about the beard and he talks about how you dress. He talked about the Arabic language in that book and this is a point. In the book is a section, the importance of the Arabic language. He said if two people know Arabic language and they, all, and they also have their own language that they speak in, they have their own mother tongue, they should speak in Arabic language because Arabic language, Allah chose it divinely to make the Quran and his Nabi in that language. So it develops and it creates some akhlaq. And talking about the virtues of the Arabs and the Arabic language in that book, Ibn Taymiyyah brought weak hadith. And he was a muhaddith. He brought hadith like the language of the people of Jannah is Arabic. That's not authentic. He brought that hadith in that book. A number of weak hadith. Rahimahullah. I'm not mentioning that because I'm better than Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah, he had a minhaj in mentioning those hadith. The point is, Ibn Taymiyyah, if he takes a position, we have to look at the delil. And if he said that the mawlid was okay because of this and that and this and that, that's his point of view. He's a scholar, he's a mujtahid. But we say, if the mawlid was permissible, the first 100 years would have did it. The second 100 years would have did it. The third 100 years would have did it. The Muslims would not have waited until 400 years to start doing this molin and to realize it was good. And if it was good, the people would have done it before us. They would have proceeded from the best of these generations. So the delil of the people who say it's not permissible is stronger than the delil of the people who say you can do it. Not only him, Suyuti said that you can do it, Sakhawi said that you can do it, other great scholars, and that's why we have to stay balanced. We respect the ulama, but the ulama, that is not the goal and the objective. The goal and the objective is the haq, the Quran, the sunnah, the delil. Yeah, I read something similar that uh, what Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah actually said was they'll be rewarded for their ikhlas but they'll get punished for doing the act of bid'ah. Shukran yeah. lakum. Sheikh al taf Sensei Shafiq. And his daughter is named Taymiyyah. And actually, Ikhwani, some of the scholars said that the correct way of pronouncing his name is Taymiyyah with a shadda on the ya. Many people make it with takhfif and they say Taymiyyah. Their correct way is Taymiyyah. But that's what we're used to. So that's what everyone says. No problem. We're not going to fight over those issues. Um, is it true that Ibn Taymiyyah said that on the Day of Judgment, the Prophet will sit next to Allah on the throne? I don't know that he said that, but I doubt it very seriously that he says something like that, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And if he did say something like that, it's rejected. It's rejected. And another thing, there's a scholar who's bigger than Ibn Taymiyyah who said something like that. And he was none other than the Tabi Mujahid. Mujahid learned the Quran Ikhwani, from Abdullah ibn Abbas 13 times, 1 3. Mujahid said, I learned the Quran from Ibn Abbas 13 times. Every single ayat I would say for every ayat, what is this? And what is that? And what is this? So the great scholar of Islam who had his own madhab, bigger than the four madhabs, Al-Imam Sufyan al-Thawri. Al-Imam Sufyan al-Thawri said, if the tafsir of Mujahid comes to you, take it. Al-Imam al-Bukhari in Sahih Muslim, he relies on the tafsir of Mujahid more than any other 
from the Tabi'een in Sahih al-Bukhari because of his unique position of learning from Ibn Abbas. Mujahid said about the ayah, Asa Rabbuka an yab'athaka maqamin mahmuda. Hakadha, Lisa Kadhari. Ayat of the Quran about the maqam al Mahmud. It may be that Allah is going to give you, Ya Muhammad, your Lord, a maqam Mahmud, Yom al Qiyamah. Some of the scholars said that the maqam al Mahmud, it is the physical place in the Jannah al Firdaus that's only for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha is going to be close to him. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ana wa kafil al yateen kahataini fil Jannah. I would be like this with the one who takes care of an orphan and he separated his fingers, the companion narrated the hadith. He didn't say like that because no one's going to be like this. He's going to have his special place in the Maqam Mahmud and people will be close to him. But no one's going to be like this because he's the Sayyid of Bani Adam. That's one meaning of the Maqam and Mahmud. Another authentic meaning of it is the Shifa Al-Kubra. The Nabi will be able to get the people out of punishment, Yom Al-Qiyamah. The people are going to go to Adam, get us out of the trouble. He said, I can't do it, I made some mistakes. They're going to go to Nuh, I can't do it, I made some mistakes. Ibrahim, I can't do it, I made some mistakes. Go to Musa, they go to Musa, I can't do it, I made some mistakes. He'll say, go to Isa. Isa won't say, I made a mistake. He'll just say, it's not for me. Go to Muhammad. When they go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah will make shifa. That's the maqam al-mahmud, authentic hadith. Mujahid, Mujahid, the tabi'i, he said the meaning of that is that Allah is going to sit Rasulullah next to Allah on the arsh. No scholar ever came and said, because of that, Mujahid is a deviant. Mujahid is this, Mujahid is, Mujahid is more knowledgeable than Ibn Taymiyyah. He learned from the companions. He's from the second generation. So let's not have the minhaj of the people who have double standards. If you're going to talk bad about Ibn Taymiyyah, make him a kafir and throw him out of Islam and all that, you have to do that with Mujahid. As a matter of fact, Mujahid being more knowledgeable, being more knowledgeable, he's the last one who should have did it. And that happened. As for Ibn Taymiyyah, I don't think that this happened. Bring that Dalil so we can read it. I don't, I don't think that happened. But if it did happen, it's a mistake that he made. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And he's a mujtahid. He gets a reward when he makes a mistake. And he gets two rewards when he gets a right. Because he's from the ulama. Qul, hal yastawu al-ladhina ya'lamuna wal-ladhina la ya'lamun. They're not equal. 